this is just recapitulation, but as I said, the last talk, one of the topics we discussed was date algorithms. And remember, date algorithm is a very, one of the easiest situations where you can solve the word problem in a group. It's where you can solve the word problem by what we call length reducing reductions. So you, if, if you have this nice property that any word that's equal to the identity, you could always, there's, there's a finite set of re reductions so that you, you could, just by applying these, you could reduce it to the empty words. That's always the easiest possible algorithm for solving the word problem, and it's many a time. So a Dane algorithm is a, an example of a rewrite system. It's the, in a rewrite system, the idea is you, re, you have reduction rules, so that this is material, I'm repeating from last time, just reminding you of the definition. Yeah, yeah so for the, the first four or five slides, you can forget about groups completely. This is, the, we're, we're, this, we're talking a bit more about word processing now, or, so, because the, the, this topic has applications in text processing and, and all sorts of things. So, and in fair idea, the more sort of automatic fair and proving that, that kind of thing, it's all big. So, we, we've just got a finite set A and called an alphabet. Of course, in the group context, the A is the, is the inverse closed set of generators. So, a rewrite system is a, is a set of. I, I, I'm not specifying finite, but mostly we're interested in finite sets of rules, u to b, where u and v are specific words, and the idea is in any word you're allowed to substitute v for u. So putting that formally, we have svt can be transformed to swt for arbitrary words s and t. And then, then I, should have, I should have used arrow star, actually, but I've used double arrow, w, double arrow, double prime, w prime, if, if there's a sequence. So either the words are equal, so it's a reflex, reflexive transitive closure, something like that. Uh, if, we could, if we could get from one word to another by a sequence of reductions, then there's a couple more de definitions. So a word is irreducible if, if there's no, if there's no W such that we can uh, uh, so, yeah, so if there's no reduction possible, maybe that's slightly confusing notation, I probably shouldn't have called it V, but yeah, I run out of letters for words. So it's irreducible if we, can't, if we can't apply any reductions to it. And another interesting, important definition, the rewrite system's terminating if there's no infinite chain of reductions. So we're, only, we're, we're mostly interested in terminating system because it's not so good if you can just go on reducing ad infinitum. Okay, so another, a few important, uh, there are some kind of critical, crucial definitions here which we mentioned very briefly last time. So confluent, what sometimes happens is that the same word can be rewritten in two different ways. You could apply two different rewrite rules to the same word, Q, and uh, I've sort of started using QRST for words now because I'm running out of symbols. And so we, we, can do, we can reduce it in two different ways, and that's fine, we can't avoid that, but what we would like to happen is if, if there are two ways of reducing Q, then we would at least like to have a possibility of getting back to some common uh, descendants. So it's confluent if whenever there are two different routes we can take. Uh, so uh, Q, R, Q, what have I got? Um, S. S, then, then there's, some, there's some common. T. T, yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah, double arrows, yeah. I should have used that as star. Never mind. So that's confluent. Now, complete means it's both. These are all desirable properties, both terminating and confluent. There's, a, there's an apparently weaker property called locally confluent, which is where we replace those double arrows by single arrows. So any, any, single redu any, any pair of single reductions applied to Q, they have a polygonal target. That's called locally confluent. Sorry? Is there a difference? 
Well, uh, yes, one step versus many steps. Apparently, I mean, there's, there's a level of about to cover that says they're not different, but if they're a priori, they're different, yeah. And okay, so there's a level, it's not a fairly easy inductive proof, but a terminating and locally confluent R rewrite system is also confluent. So, provided it's terminating, you're like, there is no difference, but that's a, that's a non trivial, if not very difficult lemma. And also, in a complete, the good thing about a complete rewrite system, I mean, again, the proof is only a few lines, you can probably believe it, but that every word can be rewritten to a unique, irreducible word. So this is, you can see, this is going to be nice for solving the word problem in groups. Because it's giving us a normal form, effectively. Yeah, so we've, we've mentioned Dane Last time we were talking about Dane algorithms as uh, examples of rewrite systems. Well, they, they are useful, but they're typically not confluent because they now are what's called confluent on the identity. The, the only thing we guarantee about a Dane algorithm is that if the word is equal to the identity of the group, then we can reduce it to the identity. We, we, we don't, we're not guaranteeing that words that equal some other element of the group can, can be reduced to a unique string. So Dane algorithms are terminating, but typically not confluent. And so today we're interested in the which are. Okay, so examining this a bit more deeply, so how could local confluence fail? Well, for local confluence to fail, there must be some word Q which, to which we can apply two distinct rewrite rules. That's clear. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any choice. And the first situation is where the two distinct left-hand sides do not overlap. And when that happens, that they're kind of independent, we can, we can apply both over, we can apply both rules independently and then they, there's a common rewrite to uh, the result of applying both rules independently. So if the two left-hand sides don't overlap, there's no problem. Uh, then, then this will not be a barrier to local confluence. So, yeah, so the problem can only arise if the left-hand sides of the two rules overlap, and so we need to examine in what ways that can occur, and then, then comes up another definition, I think it's the last definition. A critical pair is a pair of rules which might conceivably overlap in a word to be reduced. And for the to overlap, so what's going to happen is a suffix of one of the left-hand sides has got to be equal to a prefix of the other left-hand sides. Or the, the other option is that the, the whole of the left-hand side of one of them could be a, sub, a proper subword of, of, of the, the left-hand side of the other. There, there are not some of ways you could get non-trivial overlaps. Okay, so that's what a critical pair is. And so these are the things we need to analyze if we're trying to decide whether something is locally confluent and hence confluent. And you can see if the, if the rewrite rule is finite, then there's the, uh, there be only finitely many options for this. And finding them is a, is, is a sort of word processing problem. It's, it's, not, it's a string matching problem rather than a group theoretical problem. Yeah, so that's just spelling it out in the... In the, yeah, so let, let's, let's find it. So in the first, so we've got these two left-hand sides, so we've got RST, and in the first instance, we've got uh, the RS is equal to the V1, that's the V1, so that will reduce to W1T, and in the second instance, the, T, the ST is the V2, so that will reduce to RW2. So that's the kind of canonical way in which we can get two distinct rewrites. Okay, and this, similarly in the second case. Okay, so now there's another nice lemma that, again, not, proved not too difficult, but to test the local confluence, we just need to examine all of these critical pairs. I, I've, I've almost proved, I've proved this to you in a sort of hand wavy sort of way. And we need to examine for such things whether there's a common rewrite W. 
Okay, and so um, so that's so as of a finite term. So assuming it's finite and terminated, then yeah, we can uh, we can te we can test confluence and hence completeness, which is what we want to do. And okay, so. Just to make sure, uh, there's an easy way of making sure it's terminating. Sorry, there's another definition here. So we're, we'd like to terminate in something we really want all the time in this context. So the, the normal way of making sure it's terminating is to use what's called a reduction ordering. I mean, intuitively, you'd like to think somehow that these replacing a left-hand side by a right-hand side was a sort of achieving something, was simplifying the word in some sense, in other words, reducing the word in some sense. So, the, the reduction ordering is useful for this, and for it to work in this context, it, it, well, it needs to be a, it needs to be a well-ordering that's to ensure the termination, and it also needs to be closed under left and right multiplication by arbitrary substrings. So it needs to be an ordering with the property that if u is less than equal to v, then u w is less than equal to v w for, for an arbitrary spring w, and similarly on the left hand side. So that's that's a property we need in this context. And the fact, there are lots of examples of this. So maybe the favourite example, the one that's used most commonly, at least in my experience, are the things called short lex orderings, because well, that's partly because the most natural way to reduce a word is to, redu is to reduce the length. Or, I mean, we can't always hope to reduce the length absolutely. So we, we've seen that data algorithms are only going to work in hyperbolic groups. So, so if we've got kind of absolute, strict, strictly length-reducing systems, then this is only going to work in the context of a data algorithm. So we've got to allow... But on the other hand, perhaps we don't want it to make the word longer, so we've got to allow reductions of equal length words. So, so in the short length ordering, we order first by length, and then, then you have to introduce an arbitrary ordering on the alphabet and, or, and use that to break ties. So then you, this, is what, this is called the lexicographic order. Lexicographic means the ordering used by dictionaries. So that, that's just a, that's an example of rather perversely taken a, 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 a funny ordering on A, B, and C. Okay, so that's, that's an example of a reduction ordering. And the, and the point about this is it's a good way of getting termination. So if we, what we have to do to use this is, um, in, our, in our rewrite system, we make sure that in our rules, V goes to W, we always have V is bigger than W in this order, with respect to this chosen ordering. And you can see now why, why we need that closure under substrings, because that be, as long as we've got that closure under substrings, as in the definition of reduction ordering, we, we know that when W1 is greater than W2, uh, um, then... But yeah, yeah, so for any, applica for any application of the rule, then we, well, within, a word, within a bigger word, we'll know that we're reducing the total word in this ordering. Okay, and because, uh, because we've insisted it's a well ordering, then, then the R is, is terminating. So this is, uh, yeah, so we've, we've said that we can check local confluence and hence completeness. So this means that a in a, in a finite rewrite system, which is based on a reduction ordering in this sense, we can, we can actually check whether it's locally confluent. And in fact, we can do more than that. If we decide, as is often the case, it turns out not to be locally confluent, then we can add, add some new rules in the hope of remedying this undesirable situation. Okay, so this is what's called the Knut Bendix completion procedure. And it's, it's arguably one of the sort of most fundamental algorithms in, in the sort of, I can say, computer algebra law. That, that it's, it's, it's actually, a, it, people, will tell you, people will tell you this is a special case of non commutative the, the basis, which you know, it, it, it is, if you want to look at it that way. So what we do, we start with a finite 
RWS, choose a reduction ordinary, because usually these V and W are going to be equal words in a group, so we can, we, we can order the rule whichever way we, is most convenient, and so the most convenient way is to use a reduction ordinary. So then you consider all possible critical so many, many. finitely many, and uh, what, so what's going, to, what's going to happen with a critical pair? So here's our critical pair. Now, this might not be; these words might not be immediately reducible. So we uh, we reduce them, but because it's terminating, eventually we're going to hit a. Um, well, for example, the W1 by W2. Eventually, we're going to hit irreducible words. So the question is, are these words equal? If they're equal, fine, we're done. But if they're not equal, then one of them is going to be bigger than the other, so we introduce a, a new rule to the system. And carry on. So there are, there are, there are some nice implementations of this procedure. There's one by myself in KB Mag, there's a very efficient one by Charles Sims, which is, is actually available. <coughs> so, yeah. With, they, they typically have zillions of options, the implementations of this, all the, all the possible orderings and the possible ways you could do various things. Okay, so I understand all this is the procedure will, is that will not normally terminate. It, in, typically, it will just continue adding new rules indefinitely. And so, you know, so you start with five rules and you run the thing and before you do it, it's got 30,000 rules. But why do you blink? And it says, are you sure you want it to get along? And so on. OK, so if, if you're lucky and it terminates, then the resulting RWS is locally confluent and it's complete. OK, so everything so far has been about, well, you could say it's been about monoids, if you like. It's been about operations on strings. I haven't mentioned the word, well, I have, I probably have mentioned the word blue, but I. I I could have told you all this without mentioning the word group, so let's mention the word group now. So back to our standard context, T is a finitely presented group, A is the inverse closure of the alphabet. Again, we, we do the trick we did last time. To make it a monoid presentation, we'll add these relations A, A inverse equals 1. We'll choose ourselves a reduction ordering, and, and the relators will rewrite as... Uh, Reduction rules, B goes to W, with B bigger than W. So, if, if the relators are odd length, it will just be a length reducing rule, and if the relators are even length, we can make it a same length rule. Then we can run the Duke Bendit's completion, and what we can say, if it terminates with a finite complete RWS, then we can use it to solve the word problem. That's another lemma, but not, again, not a very difficult lemma. Because it means that the group, have, when, when it's once it's complete, that the group elements have unique, irreducible representatives. So to solve the word problem, you reduce your word or your two words you're trying to compare and see if they get to the same result. If they do, they're the same group element. If they don't, they're not. And well, it's actually guaranteed to complete if the group's finite. You can prove it must complete with a group, essentially because there are only, there are effectively only finitely many rules, so, so it's bound to derive the wall eventually. And so it is, in some sense, a, a, an alternative to co set enumeration for handling finite groups, trying to find the order of a finite group and so on. And usually, co set enumeration is quicker. The, the, the times where there have been cases where the group Bendix has done better, and they're typically very difficult enumerations. So, group Bendix, in some sense, it's working much harder than uh, co set enumeration. So, the cases where it, it, it succeeds where co set enumeration doesn't so are typically very difficult problems, where, of course, you're going to have to wait a long time and maybe. So, I think <coughs> maybe generate millions of reduction rules. But, so, if you're very lucky, it might happen. It might work when it's infinite. So, infinite abelian groups typically it will work, but that, I mean, that's not a great advantage. But a, a more interesting class of examples, which I'm not going to go into here, 
is for, for polycyclic groups. There's a type of ordering, a different sort of ordering, not based on length at all. It's called a recursive part ordering. That's ordering based on weight on weights of generators. So, uh, and this, and then in fact, the, the resulting relax system is exactly what most a lot of you will be more familiar with as a power conjugate presentation. So it's the ordering which corresponds to the application of rules in a power conjugate reduction rules in a power conjugate presentation. So you can you, you can treat power conjugate presentations that way. And indeed the book by Charlie Service does just that. Okay, so alright, so I, as usual I thought I should give you a nice baby example just to see this in operation. So we'll take a finite loop so we, we we can be reasonably confident it's going to work, although I should say this algorithm is even hard, is even more tedious to do by hand than coset enumeration. It's it's not something you ever want to do by hand except on groups of all the six and so on. It, it, it's it's a, it, this is an algorithm for the computer, not for the not for pen and paper. So okay, this is a group of all the six. This is the dihedral group of all the six. A squared B cubed A B squared. Now we've got to choose ourselves an ordering. Uh, because, I, because I've got the relation a squared, I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm not going to introduce a new generator for a inverse. Well, it's not cheating, I don't, I don't need to. I can think of a as being its own inverse. And b needs, a b needs an inverse, which I've called b bar. So let's choose the ordering a less than b less than b bar with short legs. So we start by writing down the initial rules from the presentation. So we've got, I say we need the inverse rules, because this, in some sense this procedure is working in the monoid dot of the group. So we've got a, a squared b, b bar, and b bar, b go to the identity. So a squared goes to 1 is one of the group relators. The, the, the b cubed relator will make, will make that b squared goes to b inverse, and the a b squared will make b a goes to a b inverse. You see, because a is less than b in our ordering, B, A, and A, B inverse have the same length, but A, B, if you were looking at B and A, B inverse in the dictionary, you'd find A, B inverse first, because that would come under A, which comes before B. So, so we prefer that. So those are our five initial rules. Now we start doing the appendix, and, I, oh, okay, so you do some work. Who can see an overlap? B and B, B inverse? Uh, B squared. B squared and B, B inverse. Exactly, yeah, that's, that's the one I thought of first as well. Okay, so, so we, we look at b squared times b inverse, and I don't need to... Okay, so b squared reduces the... Uh, uh, okay, no, b times b bar, so, so, I, so I should have that was b, b, b bar. Now, b, b bar, that's b inverse, reduces to the identity, so the whole word just reduces to b. On the other hand, b squared reduces to b bar, so the whole thing reduces to b bar squared. And both, at this stage, both b and b bar squared, b and bar squared, are irreducible because they don't involve any left-hand sides. So we can't do anything further. So we've got to introduce a new rule, which is b. So the minus two goes to b. It's sort of it's just the inverse of b squared goes to b inverse. Uh, Okay, so that's one new rule, and there's, there's just one other new rule. B squared and BA overlap. B squared, okay, so B squared is going to be inverse, so B squared A goes to B inverse A, which is irreducible. And we also have BA goes to AB inverse, so B squared A goes to BAB inverse. Now that is not, at this stage, irreducible, because uh, because B, why is BA B inverse not irreducible? Because, uh, because BA goes to AB inverse again. So that goes to AB inverse squared, which then goes to AB. So but at that stage, AB is irreducible, so is B inverse A. So we can't go any further. We need another new rule, B inverse A goes to AB. And there are still some overlaps, but this is where it gets tedious. Uh, You've now got to, you, you, there are a lot, quite a few overlaps to check, but none of them 
yield anything new. So at this stage, the, the process stops with these seven rules. And that's a complete rewrite, rewrite system which will suffice to reduce every word to its normal form. OK, so that's, that's how the process works. It's a useful tool for a computer with groups, I suppose. Uh, I say it doesn't usually terminate on infinite groups. It, it can still be used to solve positive instances of the world problem. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, the small bits lecture, uh, my sir, the, the word problem of the set of words equal to the identity of the group in a finite representative is recursively innumerable without being recursive. In general, it's not recursive, but it's always recursively innumerable. And if, if you're looking for a reasonably efficient way of actually trying to prove that a given word is the identity, if you suspect a word is the identity and you'd like to prove it, then probably to do Bendix is, the, is the, it's, a good, it's a good way of trying it anyway. So, uh, so it can be used to solve positive instances of the world problem in, in the sense that it's guaranteed that if, oh, in the first case, it, or in the first instance, it's correct if, if you reduce to one, then you're certainly element is one, that's clear from the way he built the system. But conversely, if the word is one, then eventually it will, if we wait long enough, it will tell us that. So it's semi-useful it's semi in that sense. Okay, so that's, that's the first half of the talk. So we, we, we've got a nice new method to use Unfortunately, it, 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 although it works in some cases, such as polycyclic groups, and it could be that there are other cases where it, I think all Coxeter groups have got, there might be other, other conditions have got complete rewrite systems, and we're feeling there are extra conditions there. So there, there have been some nice results proved about various groups having, surface groups certainly do have complete rewrite systems. But, its use is very restricted for infinite groups, so it would be nice to have something that works a bit more often. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So there's another class of infinite groups called automatic groups, which is based on finite state automata. So let, let me quickly... Uh, I, most people have come across finite state automata before. They're actually a special case of Turing machines. They're, it's a Turing machine in which there's no output, and uh, the, the tape is constrained always to move rightwards. So, so it's a simple computing machine over an alphabet has a set of states, one of which is the start state, that's the same as a Turing machine. And so the letters in the input string are read successively. That's, so in other words, the, the input tape is constrained to move rightwards at every move. I think that's the main restriction. And then it, just, it, it doesn't write anything, it just moves to a new state, so we've got a transition function which tells us which state it will jump to. And then what, the, what this thing does do, it accepts the word or it doesn't accept. In fact, some definitions of Turing machines have that condition, they have final states. So uh, some of the states are final states, accepting states. So essentially, the, this thing does have output, its only output is yes or no. It says, yes, I accept the word if, having read the word, it lands in an accepting state. And I say, no, I don't accept the word if, if it does. Of course, these things are, ter are terminating. There's no question that they're going into an infinite loop or anything. OK, so that's a finite state automaton. And then we have a subset of N called its language, L of N, which are the words it accepts. So that's also often called a regular language or a rational language, same thing. So here's an example. Alphabet A, A inverse B, B inverse six states. One, two, three, four, five, zero. One is the start state. Accepting states are the non-zero ones. The zero one is a kind of, is sometimes omitted. It's a kind of, what you might call a dead state. If you, if you land at zero, you're stuck there. And you, you, it's like you've fallen off a cliff. Like a, the Brexit state, so, <laughs> so um, and then, and, and in fact, you'll notice the only, the only strings it doesn't accept is an A followed by an A inverse, 
and A inverse followed by an A, or B followed by a B inverse, or B inverse followed by a B. So its language is exactly precisely the reduced words of, in the alphabet. So it's accepting, if you like, a normal form for the free group. And oh, well, that I, some people prefer to represent these things graphically. I, I'm not never been sure I agree with that. I mean, I, I don't. I'm not sure if I find that picture particularly illuminating. It's, I suppose it's nice and symmetrical. So that, that's just a diagrammatic representation of the same thing. I've missed out on state zero because, uh, and so the state two means we've just it, all, you notice know, all the all, all the arrows going to state two are labelled A. So state two, state one's in the middle where we haven't started yet. State two means we've just read an A. State three means we've just read an A inverse. State four is where we've just read a B. And state five is where we've just read a B inverse. And then, so you, there's only one, each time there's just a single letter excluded. Okay, so this, so that's an example of a, unique word acceptor for the free group. So, more generally, a word accept, of course every word acceptor if it accepts, if it's a finite state automaton with input alphabet A, as you, the, clo the closure of the symmetric closure of the generators, which accepts at least one word for each group element, and you probably prefer it to accept a unique word for each group element. It's sort of technically convenient to allow at least more than one. Uh, so a unique word acceptor is, is kind of better because then you then you uh, <coughs> then you've got a unique representative. So so what, what we've just seen is a unique word acceptor for the free group. And in fact given any finite rewriting system the, <coughs> the yes yeah, so the the you can build a automaton that accepts a unique word word for each group element by making it just accept the irreducible words. So remember, irreducible. If you've got a finite completely writing system for the group, then the irreducible words are unique representatives of the group element, and to accept the group. You, the irreducible words, all you need to do is, that's, it, that's the same thing as words that don't contain any left-hand side of any reduction rule as a subword. And languages with that property are, it's very, it's very easy to see their, their, their regular languages. So there's, there's a, there are equivalent definitions of regular languages involving uh, regular things called regular expressions. So you could, that's, an instance of a regular expression. Okay, so I just pointed out some, some of the things you can do with a, a word acceptor is to enumerate its language, and so you can you can enumerate unique words from each group element and things like that, and you can test membership of, and also you can calculate the order of the accepted language. So if we've got a unique word acceptor for G, we can at least decide, we can't necessarily solve the word problem, we need a bit more for that in G, but we can actually work out the order of the group, so we can decide whether it's infinite or not empty, that's just because that's just the, the size of the accepted language, which is something you can compute fairly easily from the finite state automaton. Right, so let, now... This is the sort of main topic of the rest of the thing. Automatic groups. So this this definition that sort of evolved slowly in the, in, during the 1980s. I was sort of fortunate to be present. I mean, one of the people working on this was David, my colleague at Warwick, David Epstein, who's now retired, but so he was in the thick of things there. So, uh, and we had a couple of computers friendly computer scientists involved as well. So it started by a paper with Jim Cannon on, different from John Cannon, but on, on hyperbolic groups. And he proved a number of properties about the 
sort of reduced words, about geodesic words in hyperbolic groups, one of which was something we call the fellow traveler property. But uh, it was Bill Thurston, a, a Fields medalist who again sort of passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. He, he, he noticed that, some of, that these properties could be expressed in terms of finite state automata. So um, there are actually two de sort of equivalent definitions of automatic group. And it's somehow the two, the fact you've got two definitions that's making them that's somehow responsible for their significance. So one is more geometric, one is more automata theoretic. And uh, so the auto automata theoretic things are better for algorithmic work, for computational work, where of course the geometrical methods are giving sort of meaning, if you like, mathematical meaning to what we're doing. So, oh yeah, so this is this tedious technical point that we want our automata to read two words in parallel and in, in the context of the day, you can consider a situation where they read them asynchronously, so not at the same speed. But for the purposes of today, we can imagine they're reading the two words in parallel one letter, one letter at a time. So you've got your two words, point, 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 point. And so our, our two our two generator automata are going to read that pair, then that pair, then that pair, then that pair, and of course then, then it reaches this point and that word comes to an end. So, uh, so we introduce a new symbol which for some reason is dollar. I, maybe it's to do with text processing. Dollar is often used to mean the end of, end of the line. So we, we use these dollar symbols to, so we'll stick, a, we'll stick a dollar symbol in there. It's nothing to do with high finance. We stick a dollar symbol in there to, just to fill out the words so they've got the same length. Okay, then we'll call this padding. Uh, this is sort of technical, tedious stuff. That, um, so UV plus is the padding of the pair UV. So now we can come to the, de oh, okay, that's the definition of padding. Our uh, two words are AB, BA inverse, BAB inverse AA. And the, pad the padded sequence is first letters of the two words AB, second letters of the two words BA, Third letter is A inverse, B inverse. Now we've reached the end of U, so we'll have to have dollar A and another dollar A. To, so that's how that's how we make we change a pair of words into a into a sequence of symbols that can be read by an automaton. So now we can get to the definition. So a group's automatic. I put with respect to X in brackets because although the definition involves X, one of the first uh, propositions of the subject is that if, if it's automatic with respect to one generating set, then it's automatic with respect to any other. So we require a word acceptor W. We, we could insist it was a unique word acceptor if we, we wanted to, but there are actually advantages for not, it's not always insisting on that. Because, I mean, for example, in, in the hyperbolic groups, you could take the language to be the set of all geodesic words if you want to, which of course is not unique because you could have two geodesic words representing the same group element. So it's convenient not to insist on uniqueness, although you can insist on uniqueness if you want to. So in the hyperbolic context, you could you could also take not all geodesic words, but the short, the, the lexicographically least amongst those geodesic words that represent the same group element. And then the, the tricky bit, for each generator in A, we need an automaton that we call MA, it's a, set for a multiplier. So it's a multiplier automata, and it's, it's, the word acceptor comes in here because it's only, going to, it's only interested in word, pairs of words which are in the language of the word acceptor. So if, a, if one of your words is not in that language, then the multiplier says, no, go away. And so it's only going to accept those words, and it's recognizing multiplying on the right by, by one generator. So the words accepted if and only if WA equals V. So it's, it's an automaton that recognizes multi multiplying by group generators. And then, um, okay, so that's what I've said. And then you could call the set of automata. W and MA, an automatic structure to Q. <coughs> so, 
This is the definition of auto automatic, and it, apparently at this stage depends on the generating set. We, we, we want a word acceptor, so in the case of the free group, we can take the thing which we've already seen, accept reduced words, but we also want these more complicated machines that read two words at a time, and that it's, it will only read, it will only agree to accept reduced words, so words of the language, and it will accept the pair if one times A is the other. So that's what an automatic group is. And I mean, this definition didn't come out of thin air. It, 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 I, think it, I think the definition is due to Thurston, but it, 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 it came about from hyperbolic groups by observing that hyperbolic groups had precisely this property. And the idea was to make them computationally somehow uh, uh, approachable or, or manageable by expressing these properties in terms of finite state automata rather than in terms of geometrical properties of Cayley graphs, which you can compute with, but less, perhaps less readily. So, okay, I, I'm going to give you the other definition shortly, but before we go any further, let's look at, there's a whole bunch of groups that are automatic, and this includes a lot of the sort of nice families of groups we all know and love. So we've got, I mentioned hyperbolic groups, which includes three groups. Virtually abelian groups, uh, geometrically finite hyperbolic groups, they're, they're like hyperbolic groups with singularities where you allow three abelian bits. Right angle darting groups, darting groups of large type, Coxeter groups. Coxeter groups was open for quite a while before it was settled by Quink and Powlett. Uh, Garside groups, including, that includes braid groups. And then it closed under direct and free products. It's also closed under the, these called graph products, which is sort of a combination of direct and free. Yeah, so it's closed under subgroups and single groups of finite index. It's not closed under subgroups, full stop. That's it, that's not hard to prove. And, but then the, on the negative side, which is a, some people find a bit disappointing, there's a most polycyclic groups, and most, in particular most nilpotent groups, are not automatic. Uh, and they're, they're only automatic if they're virtually abelian. And, which is a bit sad, but it, it somehow, rep I think this represents a fundamental divide in, certainly in the theory of three manifolds, that uh, the, the groups tend to be either, they, they, they're built up of things such as tending towards the hyperbolic and therefore they're, therefore automatic and things which are virtually soluble or something which are which are tending towards the polycyclic. And the the other flip side of the coin is that polycyclic groups can be handled with rewrite systems based on reduction or based on the, what what we call what we call the recursive path ordering. So we so we do at least have other approaches to computing in polycyclic groups. But of course, it's going to mean that there's sort of a direct product of a polycyclic group and a hyperbolic group. You can't doesn't fit into any theory. Yeah, well, short short next automatic is more interested com computationally than it is theoretically. So short next automaticity means it's firstly it's automatic and the and we have a unique word acceptor which accepts precisely the minimal words under the short next ordering. And, and short next automaticity, I said automaticity doesn't depend on the generating set, but short next automaticity does. It may even depend on the ordering of generators used in. It depends on the ordered generating set, not just on the generating set. <coughs> okay, so now I thought. Now the other. The geometric definition is involved in the algorithms as well, so to complete the picture I should tell you this. It's not hard at all to show the definitions are equivalent. So here's the second definition. The, the first part of it is just the same. We've got a, a, we've got a word acceptor, so condition one is the same in both cases. But the condition on in the other definition, we have these multiplier automata. Now that's replaced by this condition we call the fellow traveller property, so which turns out to be equivalent. So the replace condition is that 
if we have two words in the two words W and V in the language of the word acceptor, and suppose that W times some generator is equal to V, I put the distance less than equal to one means either W is equal to V or W A V is for some generator. Then the fellow travelling property says that when we look at these parts in the K graph, they they stay together. They're, they never go too far apart. So these are these are meant to be corresponding points. So they synchronously follow travel. So if we look at the 27 points along both words, they will not have gone too far apart. So it's it's like when you have two you're you're, you're tra getting a train from A to B, and there are two routes which uh, go slightly different ways, but they're never so far apart from each other. <coughs> That's more likely to be asynchronous fellow coverage. But okay, so that's that's the fellow coupler property. And that's it's not hard to see this is equivalent to the other condition. But the point is that if we've got the fellow coupler property, then these these word differences can be used as the states of the multiplier. You could use those word differences as states to keep track of where you are. And, 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 convert, well, and conversely, if if you've got the finite state automaton, then that here you're using the properties of a finite state automata that you could get you could get to an accept state in a bounded length of time. The fact that you can get to a yeah, yeah, let me uh, some interest. So if we've got the finite state automaton, so um, we're reading the two words. Now wherever we've got to, so this is MA, our multiplier, wherever we've got to, a nice thing about finite state automata is that we can if, if we're not completely dead already, then we can get to a, an accept state in, in at most the number of states of the automaton. So this is less than equal to whatever m number of states of automaton. So then you can see these two points are a bounded distance apart because we got a bounded by twice the number of states of the automaton. We could go from there to there. So we get a bound on the, so we get this fellow traveling bound. So the Two definitions are equivalent. And okay, so these words we call the word differences. Now, sort of finishing off, I'm, I'm coming to the, the, the algorithm, which is at least in the case of, I've said short necks. It's not, re not, not really restricted to short necks, but uh, um, in Katie, the, the system I talk about, Katie now only really works with short necks. My colleague Sarah Reese has written some gap procedures that work on other length-based systems such as weight, weight, weighted, so you can add weights to the generators and so on. Okay, so it inputs a finite presentation and the output is the automator in a short next automatic structure or, or fail, or which in practice means uh, you give up or it runs out of space or crashes the machine or something. So let me take you through it quickly. It, it does use Knuth Bendix, although Knuth Bendix itself is likely to be inadequate, it's not going to complete. As I've said before, the fact that Knuth Bendix is not going to complete doesn't, shouldn't put us off trying it. So what we do, we, we run Knuth Bendix, and uh, so Knuth Bendix is generating new rules faster than you can look at it, and it's, so it's generating thousands of rewrite rules. After you've generated about, so, 50,000, in a sort of typical example of moderate difficulty, let's suppose we've generated 50,000 rules or something, then we have a look, of, we, we look at the, we, so we got all these rules, U goes to V, and uh, U goes to V, and we, so we can look and see if they've got this fellow traveller property. We can look at, we can tabulate all these what we call word differences. And so, if if you observe that, that if you observe that the number of word differences is going up at the same rate as if you've got fifty thousand rules and uh, forty thousand word differences, you give up. Um, if you make, but if you've got fifty thousand rules and only a hundred word differences, then you're probably in business. Then, so that, that's the sort of thing that happens in a typical, I say, moderate typical example of moderate difficulty. You'll say, aha, although I've generated 50,000 rules, I'm only getting 100, I'm only getting 100 of word, these words that jump from 
the fellow traveling rules. So at that stage, you, you, you have to interrupt the diabetics procedure. You press control C, or I mean, I've set the my program up so you can literally press control C and it will then output all it knows so far. So then you use the word differences to construct a, an automaton, more or less what I was talking about, so whose states are the word differences, and you've got the transitions. Uh, so that the, the, the transitions are exactly so. They're like that, so I've like got U, UV. So the idea is if you're in state U, and you read A, B, you skip, you skip to A and verse U, V. Should that be a word difference? So they're the transitions, and and then okay. So you've done that step two, but then you could use these to construct what we call candidates. I call them W and MA. But at the moment, they're actually only candidates. I will be more accurate to put candidates for W and MA. And well, maybe. If you want to try and digest this, so the language of W, it's essentially those words for which there doesn't exist a shorter word which is accepted, for which W, which fellow travels with W and is equal to W in the group. So, one way around, you can see if, if any word that couldn't satisfy that is definitely, we don't want it the language because if there's if there was a shorter word like that, then that would be W was not the short next least representative because it would have a shorter one, V. So this automaton is making some attempt to check whether there is a, an easily spotted second shorter word, I mean shorter in the ordering, not short, or sort of less in the ordering, than the one we've got already. And if, if there isn't, we'll reject it. If we, if we can't find it immediately, we'll... Uh, if we can't prove there's not one, we'll say we'll assume for the moment that it is short next least. And so similar, that, that's essentially, again, that, that second condition is saying that MA is doing what we want it to do. It's recognizing multiplication by A. And I should say these, a, a, a nice feature of finite state automata is that you can perform logical operations on them. So these are what I call, we call logical operations on finite state automata. And you can, you can, you can, you can build, you can then, of course they're not always polynomial time, they, they're sometimes, they involve determinizing non-deterministic automata, so they can be of exponential complexity, which is a bit of a pain, but uh, we're, 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 they are, they are computable things. So we, yeah, so a more accurate way, I would say, can start candidates for W and LA. Okay, then, then we do various checks. So that there's a, a fairly simple check, an easy check to carry out for whether they're likely to be correct is that uh, for each, uh, for all W and language of W, does there ex and for all A, does there exist a V such that WV is in the language? Because there ought to be, because there ought to be the representative of W times A. So if that condition fails, then something's not right. Because if, if MA is the correct, if, if W is the correct word acceptor and MA is the correct automata multiplier, then for every W there ought, there ought to be V and that V should be the reduced word to W times A. So if there isn't something to your mom, and the point is, if it fails, then we can, we can go and calculate our shortest word, but we can work out exactly why it's failed. We can work out the we can work out, we can use the data we've got so far, like the two appendix data, to work out what we think is the reduction of W times A, and then enlarge the set D so that when we try again, it will accept this pair. So we can, we can make the set D bigger, then go back to state two, and the next time around, it definitely will accept this pair. And uh, as you could imagine, this could, you might imagine this is going to go into an infinite loop, but in fact, it doesn't. I mean, if our experience is that if if the group really is short, that's automatic. In other words, if we're if, if we're on the right track, then it will converge after two or three steps. 
And the interesting thing is that I, the sort of serious examples that I, although this is not theoretically a sufficient condition for the correctness, it seems to be in, in, in reality, I, I, I don't think I've ever known this condition to succeed and the whole lot not to be like. But that doesn't matter. The final step you is just verifying the correctness. And that's, that's essentially checking that the, the, the automata MA satisfy the group relators. In other words, if you apply, if you've got a group relator A, B, C, D, and if you apply, if you, if you multiply a word by A, and then by B, and then by C, and then by D, you should get back to the original word. So the, the final step is a theoretical, gives you a theoretical proof of the correctness of what you've computed. So at the, the, the output of the final step is, yes, this, what you have computed is definitely correct. So as I've, I've tried to, I, I get a lot of emails from the people who sort of run this thing and they turn on verbosity and they, and, 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 and it's printing out things like multipliers are not correct need to introduce new difference, and then and they get really worried that they think that the, the output is uh, probably wrong. But the final, the final line of the output should be, uh, yes, everything is correct, and that's the only one you, you need to uh, pay attention to. You don't need to worry that it's been printing out lots of intermediate stuff about things being all wrong. But uh, for some reason, that bothers a lot of people who use it. OK, uh, some applications, quickly some applications. We can use it to tell them whether the group's finite or for the if it's finite, we can calculate its order. We can reduce words to normal form in quadratic time, thereby solve the word problem. We can enumerate normal form words. Another interesting thing, short next structures, we can compute the growth series as a rational function. And that that's called that's had a number of applications, and so then you could go and work out its largest eigenvalues and things like that, get its growth rates and not interested in that kind of thing. And then, okay, some examples of success. One of the earliest, this is, I don't know, going back 10, 20 years now, was that this is a group of the finite infinite question. This is a group that was around for a long time as a, as a candidate that was not known whether it was finite or infinite. The way it arose is if you, if you take the simpler presentation, when Rather than the double commutator, you just take x or commutator x, y equals z, then that then you get the trivial group. So, so uh, this was part of a sort of general program to find non-trivial examples of group of three generator, three relator groups. There were not so finite groups. There were not so many known, and uh, it, it's it's been proved that you can't have d generator, d relator groups for any d bigger than three. So, or, I mean, not, not, if the, not if the group actually requires D generators, anyway. So, but there are some examples, there are some, but not many examples of three. This was part of a, anyway, it, did, it didn't work, it's not finite, it's uh, infinite, it's like actually hyperbolic. And that was a not particularly difficult example for me. Again, I think that pro, pro, you could probably do it a couple of minutes now. At the time, I think it was an hour's computation or something. Uh, uh, some other examples where we, some of these Coxter families where you've got powers of generators and commutators, there are a couple of hard cases of that. I mentioned one of those earlier, the 2, 3, 13, 4. The enumerated words, well, that's had an interesting example of applications to drawing pictures because just being able to easily enumerate a unique word for each group element, uh, it's convenient. If, if software, for, in fact, the way software for drawing pictures works, it's it, it takes every word and plots a point. So that's the, that's the test. This is the symmetry group. See, it's six generators of order four, and or, or a lot of the uh, generators are conjugate under other generators. And that, that, that was the picture in question. So it's the, that's the symmetry group of this. It's the tessellation of hyperbolic space by David Cahedon. And the, apparently the way the... Uh, picture drawing program works for each word it calculates, of course in, a, in real numbers it calculates the position it needs to put that point. So if it's got lots of words for the same group element, then due to floating point error, it's, they're all going to come out slightly different and the whole picture's going to end up a bit blurred. So it, it's a practical advantage to have a unique word. Uh, okay. 
I've run out of time, so these, these are things I might, these are other things, related things we could do, things with cognitive problems, generalised word problems, which I would have, if I had a, a, four, a fourth lecture, I would have talked about these, but as it is, it's time to stop, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Derek, for the lecture series. Given the time, I think we'll hold discussion until the of the afternoon. Just to advertise for people who may be interested in knowing about this, Sarah Reese is here in the first few weeks of October and gives three lectures, mostly around automatic groups, word problems, how to see. If you look at the uh, website of the program, you will find the lecture series already advertised. Uh, so you know, if you're not here at that time and want to come back, feel free to talk to us about doing so, because it will be a more extensive treatment of this subject.